Hello, welcome back to Fake Greenland. I'm still David Bradbury and this is the continuing saga of the Vinland map. The Vinland map continues, more than six decades after it was created, to fulfil its original purpose as a Schrödinger's MacGuffin, a thing which derives significance from debate about its significance. From May to September 2018, the Vinland map is leaving the storerooms of Yale University's Beinecke Library to be exhibited at Mystic Seaport, a short journey east along the Connecticut coast. The museum's May 10 press release explicitly links its controversial history with the current debate over fake news and takes fresh advantage of the Schrodinger's MacGuffin effect by omitting to mention that the Vinland map controversy was, with very minor exceptions, settled years ago. More stuff from 2018 later, but first this. If you've seen part four of my video series, you'll know that in 1995, a small triangle of blank parchment was cut from one corner of the Vinland map, parts of which were then incinerated for radiocarbon dating by American scientists. My first update is the happy announcement that, two decades later, a European team obtained permission to perform chemical analyses on a tiny fragment of parchment that was left over from the 1995 work the sharp end of that narrow triangle. The main purpose of the analyses was to identify an unknown substance found during the 1995 dating, soaked into the sample, in which was trapped radioactive fallout from the nuclear bomb tests which were being conducted above ground by the USA, the USSR and the UK until a ban in 1963. In addition, however, the 2015 team took a very, very close look at the tiny scrap of parchment, which they divided into three pieces for different purposes. The first thing they spotted was surface contamination by tiny green and red particles. Their analyses showed that, as you might expect, the green ones contained copper and the red ones contained iron. They were basically rust. The presence of this contamination may explain why earlier analyses detected low concentrations of iron and copper in random places all over the map. Piece A was studied microscopically to determine the condition of the parchment, which was found to have suffered damage to 95% of its fibres. It was also analysed with mass spectrometry to determine what sort of animal it had come from. The answer was domesticated cattle the overall structure indicating a calf rather than a mature animal. Piece B was washed with acetone like the dating samples back in 1995 to remove the mystery substance. Applying Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy to the washed parchment showed significant amounts of calcite on both sides as would be expected from the standard practice of rubbing chalk dust all over a parchment sheet to prepare it for writing. The substance washed out of piece B, totalling around 12% of its mass, was found to be white and waxy or fatty. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy identified it as glycerol monostearate, commonly known as monosterin, industrially processed from a natural source. The presence of aromatic compounds in association with the fatty substance could indicate that it was something like a moisturising cream. The team at this point performed a smart piece of due diligence, checking the Fourier transform infrared spectrum of yellow Vinland map ink, published in 1999 by Walter McCrone. Although McCrone's ink sample had contained calcite, it did not appear to contain detectable amounts of monosterin. The 2015 team therefore cautioned that the waxy substance was likely to be localised contamination due to handling, which would typically affect the edges of a sheet, and particularly the corners. However, they acknowledge that a result of the repair treatment performed in the period between 1950 and 1963 cannot be completely excluded. Unfortunately, the 2015 team didn't pay sufficient attention to the full history of the mystery substance. Its presence was first recognised as far back as 1967 by British Museum scientists 
who found it affecting the appearance of the whole parchment under multispectral imaging. If the monosterin is just localised contamination from fingers, then we need to assume that there is a second mystery chemical with similar optical properties soaked into the rest of the map but absent from this sample. As I indicated in part 6 of my video series, there is a more parsimonious explanation for the discrepancy between the McCrone and 2015 results, which relates to the very fragile state of the parchment. Heated monosterin was probably soaked into the blank parchment to strengthen it and give it extra bulk. Then, as normal, the parchment would be treated with chalk dust to provide a good writing surface. The map was then drawn on the prepared parchment with the faker's strange yellow ink. Walter McCrone specialised in ultra-microanalysis, using a very sharp pointed tool to remove samples so small they are invisible to the naked eye. In this case, his sample would be just yellow ink with some of the underlying chalk dust. The parchment reinforcement explanation was not my idea. It was mentioned as a common practice by other British museum scientists as soon as the report of the 1995 dating was published in 2002. Repeated failures to pay attention to advice from British museum specialists have been something of a theme in the Vinland map saga, perhaps related to its function as a Schrodinger's MacGuffin. At this point though I need to mention a similar failure of my own. After I had made my video series, I discovered that 2002 was not the first time the results of the 1995 tests had been professionally presented. Garman Harbottle of the 1995 team revealed them at an international conference as early as 1996. The topic was very relevant to the conference, but there are a couple of catches. First, apart from Harbottle, only two of the 60 or so delegates were from English-speaking countries. Second, Having paid to have a copy of the conference report sent to my local library, I found that, unlike most other contributors, Harbottle had not had the text of his speech included in the report, so what was printed was just the pre-publicity. I have slightly better news on the long-forgotten Zurich copy of Yale's Speculum Historiale and Historia Tartarorum volume. It has now been fully digitised and uploaded online, so it can be compared word for word with the Yale version, which was made about a century later. One immediate benefit is the explanation of this note at the end of Yale's copy, which would most likely have been volume 6 of an 8 volume set. The Zurich copy is in four big fat volumes, so the note appears at the end of volume 3, where it should do. End of mystery. On the other hand, here's a small revision of the claim that the maker of the Vinland map used a slightly incorrect 1783 engraving of Andrea Bianco's 1436 world map. Here are a couple more examples of the evidence for that claim, but also evidence that the engraving may just have been used for convenience by a forger who also had access to a photographic version and used that to add one or two features missed in the engraving. I like evidence which makes me think twice, so now I'm going to spend a few minutes ranting about another video which has appeared online since I made my series. In 2016, Kirsten Seaver, who had proposed over two decades previously that the maker of the Vinland map was a German Jesuit named Joseph Fischer, gave a speech at the Library of Congress in which she reiterated her claim. Incredibly, she gave not a hint about the mass of contrary evidence which had emerged in those two decades, from the discovery of the nuclear contamination to the 2013 revelations of a Spanish, not German, provenance. The reality is that we still do not know who made the map because he was almost certainly just an anonymous professional forger, working to instructions from crooked book dealer Enzo Ferrioli. As this 2016 speech seems to be the most recent public statement of Kirsten Seaver's position, which I had rejected in my own first publication about the Vinland map back in 2004, I shall now attempt to refute her key claims in detail. First, a significant point she avoided in the speech. In 2012, her theory that Father Fisher made the map for himself was tested for a Smithsonian Channel documentary about the map by seeking the opinion of a forensic handwriting analyst. The expert, Robert Beyer, was more polite than encouraging. 
Straight away we see that Siva may have been a victim of the familiar research problem known as confirmation bias. But now here's the key piece of evidence presented in Siva's speech, a fragment of the Speculum Historiale which she has unfortunately been unable to find in order to compare it directly with Yale's volume. Even more unfortunately, Additional details from the 1934 auction catalogue, presented by Siva in her book Maps, Myths and Men, do not seem to support the theory that the German volume is from the same set as Yale's. In discussions about the 2013 discoveries by John Paul Floyd, Siva's position was that the Yale speculum volume is not a perfect match for the one which was described in connection with the 1892 Columbus celebrations in Spain. Here's why I think not perfect is still good enough. The full descriptions found by Floyd can be seen in part 6 of my series, but here I link key points with images from the Yale volume. The most significant item in this first comparison is the blank space where the capital letter at the start of a paragraph should be. Needless to say, that is not a common situation. Yet, both the 1892 volume and the Yale volume suffer such a lack. The Historia Tartarorum was at the end of this volume in both the 1892 description and originally in the Yale set, but at the end of a different volume, as it happens, in the earlier set from Zurich, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. The number of leaves of parchment at first seems too small. 251 is less than Yale's 239 plus 16. However, librarians, unlike manuscript archivists, tend to ignore blank pages, which would help to explain the difference. Otherwise, the descriptions are perfectly consistent. Siva's own description of the Yale volume in the speech was rather less precise. By mistakenly describing the Yale binding as comparatively modern, she subconsciously linked it with the modern binding of the German fragment described in the 1934 auction catalogue. Over the many years I have been aware of Siva's theory about Father Fisher, my main problem has always been the psychology of it. Here, for example, we are required to believe that a fine and diligent scholar, working mostly for his own interest in recreating a hypothetical medieval map, has abandoned his sensible habit of expanding medieval names ending in son to descriptive phrases indicating son of, which works as well in Latin as it does in German and English. And now, a rant within a rant. Siva's wintry east is just the most recent of a long line of misunderstandings of a simple two-word phrase going all the way back to George Painter, the original translator of the Historia Tartarorum. The word Orient only means East by association. Its true meaning is where the sun rises. Before the invention of the compass, that was simply the quick and dirty way to find East. Hence, the actual direction of Orient changes throughout the year. Experts at the 1966 Vinland Map Conference were sure Painter's translation was wrong, but they weren't sure what was right. So another expert was consulted afterwards and provided the explanation illustrated here. This definition remained relatively common knowledge for centuries after the compass was invented, as shown by its inclusion in one of the most popular early modern geography textbooks. Although the author spent his career in the Netherlands, he was German by birth, which would give Father Fischer a double reason to be aware of his work, and not to misuse a phrase with a known geographical significance that had been explained with utmost clarity. In fact, if any of the experts from George Painter onward has shown a little humility and consulted the standard Latin to English dictionary, they would have seen that seasonal sunrise terms were common even in ancient Roman literature. Even worse, the map borrows the phrase from the accompanying Historia Tartarorum, where it is used to describe the situation of India, which for medieval invading armies was effectively southeast of everywhere, inaccessible except from the northwest. Returning to the main rant, here's Siva's suggestion about Father Fisher's motivation. After his death, his map would present a sophisticated dilemma for the hated Nazis. Really? If I were a Nazi, I would mistrust the map, but use it for inspiration, and conduct more research on medieval writings about Vinland and the Aryan explorers of the Atlantic. In fact, as the Q&A session after the talks revealed, 
Even Siva seems unconvinced by this crucial aspect of her own theory and has no plausible explanation for the 12-year gap between Fisher's death and the first documented appearance of the map. The reality seems to be that, by 1957, the supply of valuable items looted during the Second World War, which had attracted smart ex-service men like Lawrence Witten into the no-questions-asked-used-goods trade, was running low, hence Enzo Ferrioli's need to steal from the church. Here ends the Kirsten Siever rant. Now for a shorter rant about the third historical document in Yale's Historia Tartarorum volume, which you're seeing here. No, you really are. Here it is with some contrast enhancement. Your familiarity with the standard Western alphabet should be telling you that it's a text in a European language and that it's the right way round, not a print through from text on the other side of the paper which would be reversed. In 2013-14, to 14, a team at the University of Winnipeg, led by Michael Attus, tried using hyperspectral imaging in various wavelengths of visible and infrared radiation to make this very faint text legible. The results were pretty, but not overwhelmingly useful. Bizarrely, their initial report nowhere contains the term Iron Gall Ink. I say bizarrely because European documents before the late 19th century were almost always written in Iron Gall Ink, and when you bleach Iron Gall Ink, you end up with just the sort of yellow mush that is seen on the document under investigation. The best wavelengths for investigating remnants of iron gall ink are not visible, not infrared, but ultraviolet. Probably every archive in the world which holds European documents has an ultraviolet light source to help with reading faint iron gall text. If you pay close attention to the left side, you'll see that this image of the tantalising document is not really in black and white, but in full colour. It is made from a negative probably photographed in the 1980s and I suspect that an unadjusted print would reveal that the image has a blue cast indicating that it was lit with ultraviolet. For comparison, consider this document written with iron gall ink. Forget about the writing you can see, concentrate on that blank space near the top. When lit with ultraviolet light, the document shows a blue cast, but more importantly, in that blank space you can now see a fuzzy reverse image of the text on the other side of the document. That's how effective ultraviolet illumination is with iron gall ink. For what it's worth, I don't think imaging in any wavelength will make the mystery yellow text legible because remnants of the bleached ink have soaked into the parchment and the contamination will respond to the same wavelengths as the text. The best hope is probably a scanning chemical analysis which may detect small but sudden changes in concentration at the edges of the original lettering. One member of the hyperspectral imaging team was Jacqueline Olin, a long-time investigator of the Vinland map with some strange views on iron gall ink. On ResearchGate, she continues to seek scientific validation for the map, which has led her into some basic errors. Here is an argument she made in late April 2018 against the 1974 description of anatase particles in the Vinland map ink accompanied by the relevant extract from the 1974 paper, which in reality agrees with her but merely uses different terminology. Romb shapes are definitely not spherical. At this point, I present an element of very serious comedy. This 1998 paper by Chin and Brewer attempted to list all possible responses to new data which challenged existing scientific understanding of a topic. Their list included eight possibilities, from simply ignoring the data, through doubting its validity, or even just leaving it in the to-do pile hoping that somebody else would respond to it, all the way up to accepting it unreservedly and changing the theory it challenged. In 2007, as a direct consequence of the messy discussions about the Vinland map in the early noughties, Zhe Yan Lin suggested a ninth possible response to anomalous data uncertainty about how it should be interpreted. Lin also investigated the value of mediation in resolving such situations, which I think is an excellent idea. In reality, all data on the Vinland map is consistent with a narrow range of scenarios based on forgery in the mid-1950s, but in some cases the published research reports need additional interpretation or mediation to make them useful. Now we go back to the future. Yale is taking advantage of the 2018 exhibition to perform new scientific tests on the Vinland map. In a sense, this can be seen as a beneficial use of Schrödinger's MacGuffin, 
giving researchers the chance to try their skills on something about which a great deal is already known. I do just hope that for the DNA testing, the lab has been supplied with samples from both halves of the map. Viewers of my original series will remember that one controversy is whether the two halves, which are now separate, were ever a single piece. And finally, from the same article, a bit of fake news. It looks as if this expert was asked to provide a few off-the-cuff sound bites at a moment when he had better things to do. Had he thought for a minute or two, he would, for example, have remembered that this claim about how double-page maps are bound into books was nonsense. Here's how it's done, gluing the maps along the centrefold to a hinge which is bound into the book. This trick is very old and was even used for the Andrea Bianco Atlas of 1436 from which the Vinland map was copied crudely by the forger.